Hey everyone, it's Becca. This is First Line Frenzy Live, and today I will be joined by Neely Alexander, author of Love Buzz. Uh, you are going to absolutely adore this book, and I can't wait for Neely to tell you the story of how we met and why it's so exciting that she's on First Line Frenzy today. Um, it's a couple minutes before the top of the hour, so we're going to give everybody time to get here. Um, and yeah, I, I can't wait for you guys to meet Neely. She is so smart and so funny and just great all around. Um, we've known each other for a little while now because of the story that she will tell you. And uh, yeah, her book comes out next week and it's gonna be amazing. So let me find, uh, let me find Neely and see, oh, there she is. Really press the button again and cancel it. So she'll be here in a second. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love, oh, Neely, you're here. Hi. 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 How are you? I'm great. Oh How are you? I'm good. Oh my gosh, my face is so big. <laughs> <laughs> I have such like a Jimmy rigged setup here for doing a live because I can't do it from my computer. So trying to do it from my phone is like, um, chef, well, you have but... the right background. I mean, did you, this is, it's a gorgeous book. Are you so thrilled with how the cover turned out? Thank you. Yes, I'm thrilled with how it turned out. And um, the designer, Joe, is amazing. And she sent like three initial samples over. And I had a really hard time choosing between two, actually. Um, but yeah, this one I just fell in love with. And the font is actually the same mm. Nirvana logo font, which is fun because the, the song is so fun. Yeah, the song is um, Love Buzz is a Nirvana song title. And so we use the same font, which was really fun, too. So I love those little Easter eggs. I was going to say, that's such a yeah. great Easter egg. And font selection is hard. I mean, yes. it's, it's just so challenging. And especially when you have someone who can sort of create something new also. Like, yeah, I can't imagine. That's got to be a tough choice. Yeah. Um, so I promised the people at home that you would tell them how we met and why it's so exciting that you're doing First Line Frenzy. Yeah, well, this is a very full circle moment for me. Um, we met, gosh, it was two years ago now. Well, we've never met in person, but online met um, because I was a fan of First Line Frenzy. I had watched them forever. And I was at the point where I wanted to hire a developmental editor. And I reached out to you. You gave me a reader's report for a book that was not Love Buzz. Um, the first book that I had finished that I was, I thought naively, I'm going to give it to Rebecca. She's going to love it. She's going to give me a few notes and I'm going to be on my way out into the world. And that's not what happened. Um, you gave me what I like to call a scathing developmental edit. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember our conversation and I remember saying to my husband that night, I spoke to the nicest author today. I was like, you know, it was kind of a big critique, but like she was just so ready for the feedback and I really think she's going to make it. Like I really, I had such a great impression of you after that. After that. Oh, well, that's good to hear. I put on a brave face then because I certainly didn't necessarily feel that way. And so I, I had a decision to make. I remember very vividly, we spoke on a Friday um, and then on, I kind of took the weekend to think about, you know, our conversation and the notes you had given me and do I apply those to this book or, and try to, you know, salvage it? Or do I apply everything I've learned through this process to the next thing? I chose the latter. Wow. So that we talked on a Friday and then Monday I started what became Love Buzz. So you were a, a big part of that process. And that's in hard. Our I would say also like <sighs> making that decision had to have been really tough. How long did you spend working on the draft of the book that I had read? Oh gosh, probably a year and a half. I mean, yeah. it was, it's a book. It takes a while. Right. And, um, I, I re remember feeling really down about it. Right. Cause again, you finish a book and it's this whole, it's a huge accomplishment. It's a very big accomplishment, especially when you do it for the first time and you feel really proud as you rightly should. Um, and having to kind of take that blow of, yes, I did this, I, I had this huge accomplishment and I accomplished this big thing but maybe it's not ready or right for that next big thing is a really hard lesson. And I, I had to really think about it, but I also didn't want it to define sort of what my career quote unquote in writing could look like. And the great thing is once you sort of unlock that ability to finish a book from start to finish, um, it becomes easier the next yeah. time, not easy, but easier. Easy. Right. Yeah. Cause you know, you can do it. It's, I always say it's kind of like yeah. driving, like learning to drive and then you take the driving test and it's so nerve-wracking 
But then like the second the, the second the state is like, no, you you can drive, it's fine. Yeah. Then all you're like a hundred times better at it almost instantly because yeah. you know you can, you know, and it's just like I never have to write my first book again. Exactly. And, and it's never wasted, right? I mean, I learned so much through that process of not only the critique, but just of putting that many words down on a page, right? Yeah, and they all relate to each other that tell one story. Right. That's and cute. learning the art of storytelling and right. I mean, it's never wasted for sure. It's not. Well, I certainly think you made a great choice uh, because this is wonderful. Um, I, I have a couple of favorite lines that I will share um, throughout the hour, but we should get to the goods on First Line Frenzy. So because you're a longtime watcher, I know that you um, know how this works. But just to give you a refresher, because now you're on the other side of the desk, oh. I have a dozen lines picked out um, from a variety of genres, and I will read them out, uh, and you'll be facing them, and you just give me your first impressions, and we talk about, could they be better? Are they perfect? If they are imperfect, what is imperfect about them? Um, and don't worry too much about the grammar stuff. I kind of have that covered, though, of course, all grammar input is always welcome. And... Uh, Keep track of the numbers okay. if there's one you really like, because our favorite of the day will be getting a copy of Love Buzz. I'm ready. Um, right. I'm going to now be like the most awkward part is that I have not yet found an elegant way to just like move everything. So, well, again, you should see my setup of how I have my phone rigged right now to be able to. I bet that. To Hold on, I'm going to move things so that you can actually move all my Lisa Frank stuff. And. <laughs> And then bring this closer so we can actually see it. Can you read that? Yes. Okay, good. Hopefully everybody at home can read it too. All right, so here we go. We're off to the races. Drake Bloodworth's public lifestyle and expensive cars make him an easy man to kill. From an adult romance. So I have to tell you before I, I say anything, I have the worst poker face. <laughs> Of anyone okay. I know. I so serve you in first line frenzy. So having to do this and like try to not give things away in my face is really challenging, but I'm gonna try. <laughs> I, if you've watched first line frenzy, you know that I don't have a poker face at all. I just <laughs> let it all hang out. And I actually, I did a Reedsy live first line frenzy. I think last month. And one of the guys whose line, like, we reviewed a line, and this guy wrote a comment, and he was like. I, I think based on your expression that you really like my title too. I mean, is that correct? And I actually had kind of grimaced at the title, oh, which was terrible. Oh and no. I was like, wow, okay. And I just didn't respond. Like I don't respond to most comments on YouTube videos because I care about my mental health. And, um, but it was just so funny because I was like, oh, I guess maybe, maybe I'm not as expressive as I thought. Or like, maybe I'm confusing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I've, I've hyped for you so you had time to think about this line. What do you think? Yeah, so I, I, I like the idea of something really detailed about someone and then what, what the kind of um, connection is that we're making, right? So because he is this, that it somehow makes him this and two things that maybe are not expected. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of that. Um, and sort of what we're trying to accomplish here. I don't necessarily understand the connection between these two, though. Um, his public lifestyle and expensive cars making him an easy man to kill. Is that because he's very flashy? And so pe the, it's assumed that there are going to be people who don't like him or, you know, would want to kill him as a result of that. That feels like a bit of a stretch to me. Um, I think it has to do with something about his, like, public visibility, like he's easy, maybe easy to track because of the cars, okay. like because they're kind of obvious. What I, I'll say what I like about it. First of all, I, I obviously there's no subgenre listing on First Line Frenzy, but Drake Bloodworth, if this isn't some kind of paranormal situation, if this is supposed to be contemporary romance in like our version of the world, this name has to change because it sounds like Drake Bloodworth comes from a long line of vampires. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm okay with that but I just want to make sure that we know that from the outset. Um, I like it because I am curious about why the public lifestyle and expensive cars make him an easy man to kill. And I want to know why he's on someone's hit list. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe this is like his security detail. 
And like, this is about how, you know what I mean? I just, I like the way this opens doors to, mm -hmm. this could be from the point of view of the person who would like to see Drake Bloodworth ended, or it could be like, like I said, from someone who's trying to keep him safe and is actually frustrated by this public lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera. So I kind of like all the possibilities here. I'm, I'm intrigued. I think it's quite pithy. Yeah, well, now that you're talking, I, I want to know all those, those answers, too. So, <laughs> now that I've sold it to you on a silver you sold it to me. Like to buy it. <laughs> you sold it to me. Yeah, no, I do like also that it's not trying to do too much, yeah. right? I mean, it's a very just blanket statement that, you know, there, there's not a lot, a lot of fluff or, or pomp around it. It's just sort of a, a direct statement, which is always nice with a first line. Yeah, if there's something clear about it, but also it's not boring at all. And it's yeah. not boring because of the gotcha, which is that mm -hmm. make him an easy man to kill, which is great. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm actually a big fan of that one. I'm curious about the same genre, but great first I, start. I do like that one. Yeah, it's a strong start. All right, our next line comes from a YA fantasy. When Sir Catherine set out to look for the kidnapped princess, he had expected to find a frightened girl surrounded by savages not a woman in war paint holding a spear point to his throat. I'm also hearing a ton of feedback on the line, so I'm going to run and grab my headphones. You can start talking about this line. I'll only be away for two shakes of a lamb tip. Okay. Um, so I like the idea that, again, the element of surprise, right? He's expecting one thing and find something else. So we want to know what changed through the course of this process of he expected to find a frightened girl. Instead, she is um, a woman. So the change from girl to woman, right? And war paint holding a spear to his throat. So the element of surprise in a first line is certainly interesting. Um, I think we'd have to be a little careful here from a sensitivity perspective of what savages means and kind of who we're referring to um, in the use of that word and, and you know, kind of what, what that looks like in the story as it plays out. Um, but yeah, overall, I'm intrigued in terms of the, the element of surprise. Yeah, I also really liked the sort of the reversal, you know, uh, what you expect versus what you receive. I find the word savage is extremely problematic. This is also an N dash E N. And um, what we need here is an M dash E M. So a longer dash um, actually looks like that. Uh, and you can sort of read about the nuance between the M dash and the N dash in the Chicago Manual style, my favorite style guide. Um, but yeah, overall, I think this is a real problematic sitch right here. You can't escape the long history of damage done by words, uh, you know, in our ordinary world. So regardless of what this word has come to mean in the fantasy world of this novel, uh, in our world and the world that your readers live in, this word is really loaded and problematic and I would change it. Uh, but otherwise, I think this is kind of, great right yeah yeah i like it i like it too all right moving along let me brighten this up too there we go doot, doot, doot. someday i'll figure out a really high-tech way to do this that looks very beautiful <laughs> but until then i'm just gonna this works. take it back to the 90s okay uh this is from an adult general commercial submission and it reads dad joked with us that our family crest is a goose with two hands strangling its neck it means the Peltons who trade by the water are thieves, except for his grandpa, Willis Pelton, the painter, whose work sits in a gallery in Maine. It's a lot. It's so like this is trying to do a lot. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a lot to take in. And I think I, it lost me a bit. Yeah. Um, I'm curious what your, what your grammar feedback is on the semicolon. Yeah, so my first feedback is this sentence gets a big boost when we do that. Yeah. I mean, that's your first sentence, the end. Um, but if we have to look at the whole, whole thing, um, like, yes, a semicolon connects two sentences whose meanings are so interconnected that they can't really be understood individually. Does that apply here? Only a little, right? Uh, only because you create a beautiful question here, which is what does this mean, right? The goose yeah. with two hands strangling its neck. But it, it like, but I can understand that as an as an individual clause without without knowing what it means because the explanation, which is that it means the Peltons who trade by the water are thieves, it, it, I still don't understand why it's a goose with two. Like I, 
I don't understand how that image and that meaning go together. Yeah, um, I actually love um, the edit you made, which is just to take yeah. it up to the first Just end half. it. Yeah, just end it there. Um, when we, I, I see this all the time, errors in how to pluralize surnames. Um, it's very easy. You just put an S on the end. You don't use an apostrophe because nothing belongs to them here. It's just the Peltons. Uh, plural, the many Peltons who trade by the water are thieves. I, I mean, I wouldn't even mind if we could somehow work in this part. Uh, if we could make that work, obviously we'd have to change the semicolon and the it. But that's quite interesting as well. But honestly, any editor worth their salt says this is the line. Yeah, and that's interesting to me right I mean I I like the it's very specific yeah um to, the, to them and their family and it um alludes to some sort of dark sinister you know or bad luck types of things oh, within yeah. their family yeah, for sure. so I'd love to learn more just based yeah. on that I this is the kind of line that forces us to ask what I call the right kinds of questions yeah right I don't the questions I don't want to ask are about logistics or like is that anatomically possible right like those are bad questions but this is a cool question, which is, what the hell does a goose with two hands strangling its neck mean? Yeah. I also say that um, using our family here negates the necessity for with us, because you, you've already included us here. Sure. So we might as well just strip that out. I really like our revision. I was not super impressed with the original. The original is just too much. And it was all kind of cool. It was all interesting stuff, right? Um, all of these individual details are great, but there's too many of them in one sentence and make you're, gonna, for a, you're gonna lose us, yeah. Yeah, it'll make for a great first paragraph. Yes, absolutely. Um, we do have a question actually. Let's see, Can, I've never had a question like this before. <laughs> oh, are there different first line rules for different genres? Mm -hmm. um, generally, I say no. Sometimes for different audiences. Um, I'm actually gonna, you can, is it gonna be awkward if I'm this close? Okay, yeah, kind of. Um, I would say, you know, when we get into middle grade, there's actually a middle grade submission in this batch of lines. And the rules are slightly different when we start talking about young readers. Um, but on the whole, I am looking for character, conflict, and style in, or like voice in the first line. And that's across every genre. Um, and there are nuances to that, obviously. Uh, but overall, I think that if we had to generalize, like if we were looking for a rule of thumb, that would be the rule of thumb. Complex so character voice. Not to derail too much, but I have to tell you this. So of all of the first line frenzies I've watched, and there was one line that stuck with me for so long. Which one? Can I tell you what it was? I wonder yes. if it stuck with you too. Um, it was Mama Died peculiar, peculiar. I think that's what the line was. Yes. And yes. I just thought that was so good I mean it's three words and simple and it was just I wanted to know so much more that was the line of all the lines that has like always stuck with me that's amazing you know it's funny I I was at, at, at the yoga studio earlier this week and um one of my friends at the studio said you know you have changed the way I teach my classes and I was like thank you so much tell me some more um because uh, I wasn't teaching, right? I'm not teaching yoga right now, but yeah. I used to teach. And she said, in one of your first line frenzy videos, you talked about zombie limbs and zombie fingers and how you can't about how like the body parts are attached to a sentient being and, and that sentient being. Oh, moves. Yeah. And I've been, and I realized when I've been teaching yoga, I've been cueing, you know, hand lifts or like stretch leg instead of stretch your leg or lift oh, your arm. And so she was like, and now I'm really thinking about like the people, the whole person, you know, moving in my class instead of just moving, like choreographing limbs in space. And it's totally changed. And I was like, wow, that is amazing. How yeah. wonderfully interdisciplinary of us. But she also remembered the line and like some of them just lodge in your brain. Yeah. And so I, you know, what's funny is that I couldn't like pick one out and say like, yes, I remember this line. But when anyone mentions, oh, you did a critique about X, Y, or Z, I know exactly what line they're talking about, like immediately. That's so funny. I think it just maybe means that I'm very egotistical. <laughs> All right, well that, if you have any other questions, you can use the question button to ask them and I will put them up. We're gonna go That was back. a good question. Yeah, that was a great question. Thank, thank you so much. Um,
I'm going to go back to this. My phone is being very, my like little holder thing is being very um, persnickety today. So let's just, there we go. Okay. Bloop, bloop, bloop. All right. This next submission, an entire screen's worth, as you will already have guessed, is adult literary. <clears throat> Midday precisely. The minute hand of the electric clock held back, then overlapped the hour hand, making it insignificant, barely existent, all hands of time in one single place. The moment when today was yesterday and tomorrow, perfect to end my practice in Hartford, to end, to start, to go, to stay, all in the same click. So it's midnight? Is that, is that what I'm saying? No, I mean, I'm, I'm wanting to make sure. Oh, it's midday, so it's noon. <laughs> is that? I no, I'm, that, I'm really just trying no, to make sure. I love that your brain is like, well, the first thing we need to know is exactly what time it is. So it's, um, it's noon, it's I'm assuming, because the hands are overlapped. It's midday yep. precisely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm with you. Um, so it is adult literary, which we look for, you know, purple prose, if you no, will. No, or... we don't. No, we don't look for purple prose. We find it, but we are not ever looking for it. This is... Yeah, this is, I, so viewers of First Line Fancy will know that I believe and preach that literary is a stylistic choice more than a genre. I list it as a genre because I have to, but it, it, literary fiction denotes a certain relationship to language and narrative form that is very sophisticated. It is not part of launch to like word vomit all over the place which is what this is right you, it, it's it's word vomit <clears throat> well and literary is hard because you have to toe a line of being precise and clear um mm -hmm. and still having beautiful prose that make people kind of stop and want to read that line again and those are two really difficult things to do um and to have come together you know in a way that is um that it that it doesn't halt people from being able to still follow a story. Yes. Uh, you know, all literary fiction is genre fiction, but with extra icing. Mm. And, and literary authors hate to hear this, I guess, some of them, because they're in denial, but all literary fiction still requires a plot, right? Like, right. It, it just it just does. Um, and the best literary novels are not precious about the need for plot and compelling character. They embrace it and they celebrate it. Um, you know, by starting out with this phrase, midday precisely, you have obviated every other thing here, right? All of this <laughs> modifies, hey, it's noon. Like, who, who cares? I, I just, it's noon, so what? I mean, if you are the type of character who belabors the ticking of a clock this heavily, I am not interested in your story because you will bore me to tears. Yeah, it's doing, too, it's trying to do too much. And I wonder if the sentiment, um, you know, if there's a way to still get the sentiment across that um, with a lot less words and a so lot, a lot lot less. Less the element. Yeah, well, let's think about that. Is there a way to do it? Um, first, I think whenever I start an edit like this where I just see so much language, the first thing I say is, what can I get rid of? Yeah. First I'm thing I'm going to get rid of is this insanely twee parenthetical phrase. The mo moment when today was yesterday and tomorrow. I mean, honestly, first of all, that is midnight. That's not midday, right? We all know that. And, I'll, and it's just very like a Hallmark movie channel conception of time. I think that's me. why I went to midnight instead of midday and yes. even though it says it at the beginning. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Um, all hands of time in one single place also seems, uh, I mean, it's very poetic, but it's kind of, what does this mean? If that were standalone, I would like that line. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we can get rid of all this crap and keep that midday precisely. Mm. All hands of time and one single is redundant. So a single place. And then let's make it an actual sentence instead of just musings on time.
I also don't know what practice in Hartford means, and I don't necessarily need to know that in the first line. But, Agreed. Um, I wonder if there's something like one or two more words to be added that make it more specific to make yeah, give me a better like understanding a of veterinary what veterinary practice, a law right. practice, you know, we don't know. Um, yeah, this is still imperfect because of the repetition of the word time, but it is so much better than what was there. And I like we still um, have an we still have a literary element, right? All hands of time in a single place. That's yes. beautiful. Um, yes. And we have we still have components of that, but it's a little bit more precise than it was before. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think it, it keeps sort of that literary feel without the weight of all of those useless words. Right. Uh, we did get a question about literary versus genre fiction, and I will put it up eventually, but I do want to get through all of our lines. Um, this is number 331 from an adult romance. I have, I have totally stacked the deck with romance for you, but I did <laughs> I love it. quite a lot. Um, as the anesthesia wore off, alarms, alarms, waking up. Alice felt the sting of the harsh lighting, leading to a pinch of regret at having signed up for elective neurosurgery. So I will say you also scolded me for waking up because the book that you you <laughs> did the edit for yes. started with the waking up scene. So I've Look, been scolded for no the No one is same. immune. No one is immune. <laughs> it's just so, it's so cliche. And what's funny is I was... Um, chatting with John Darga, who is an agent at Avidas Creative and a friend of mine, and he does these First Line Frenzies with me sometimes. And he had mentioned First Line Frenzy on Twitter, and I reached out and said, hey, thanks for, you know, spreading the word. And he said, I just have read so many lines of, like, generalizations and people waking up, and I'm so tired of seeing these lines. Mm. So it's not even that, like, like, yeah, it's a cliche, but beyond that, like, it's a cliche that people are still using. So with so much prevalence that it's boring for agents. So like, just don't do it. It's just, and I don't care if you're waking up from a hundred year sleep or a coma or a surgery, waking up is waking up and it's boring every time. So like fast forward this three hours and then, you know, this is not, yeah. Blech, blech. I, I think there's, I'm very intrigued by the idea, idea of elective neurosurgery. Yeah, that's interesting. So interesting. So maybe start the, start this off by saying something like, um, uh, you know, the, the greatest boon of elective neurosurgery wasn't the unlimited jello in recovery. It was something else. You know, like, get me past the point of waking up. Maybe you're still in the hospital. You're definitely going to introduce this idea of elective neurosurgery straight off the bat because it's very weird and interesting. But, like, get us past this moment. No yeah. Cares. And I also wonder, um, so you're, you're waking up from anesthesia after neurosurgery. I understand the lighting would be the first thing you see. So that makes sense for the waking up scene, but I also would want to know so much more first, um, yeah. in terms of, is it, is it pain? Is it fogginess? Is it, um, the light, the lighting has nothing to do with the internalization of what is happening. Mm -hmm. So I would yes. want to know a little bit more about kind of, you know, is it, is it brain surgery? Is it cosmetic? Sur I, mean, I don't think neurosurgery could be cosmetic, right? But I would want to understand a little bit more about. Um, right, like, is this eternal sunshine of the spotless mind where she's having. Yeah, like injury? another hint towards what it is. Yeah. Right. Or is it some kind of like, uh, yeah, certainly I think that would be really nice. And just getting us past this moment of, of waking, which is already discombobulated. And then again, feeling the sting of harsh light. And then how does that, like, what is the causation here? Like, how does. How does the sting of harsh lighting cause the pinch of regret? I agree with you. Those two things aren't well aligned. So maybe yeah. it's something like Alice, you know, stared up at the harsh hospital lighting, feeling a pinch of regret for having, you know, something along those lines where she's already awake. We incorporate the lighting um, and then we know then it's elective surgery. So we're asking questions and interested about what that means. I have an idea for an edit. I'm going to type it, see how you feel about it. Hmm. I want to phrase it the right way. Hold on. Um, but I want to say, I thought I had a way to say it, but it's not as pithy as I, as I hoped it would be, is basically, I love the idea of possibly regretting the surgery. So what about something that just says, like, uh, um, it was too late to regret mm. 
like like something about how like um or had i was, known yeah something like it was too late to regret elective neurosurgery yeah like i love that isn't that that's kind of what i thought of first because, yeah i love that whoopsie doodles it, where are my fingers it was too late to regret elective there we go i love that I, I think it's simple right it like she could still be in the hospital maybe like I just right. this opens the door in a nice way and again brings up those good questions good questions mm -hmm. what the hell is elective neurosurgery <laughs> what are the regrets oh no it gives us a good oh no feeling yeah um, which I really like as well and I love that. sort of and it's a little funny too right like mm -hmm. I I'm, maybe that's schadenfreude but I think that's a little funny <laughs> I do no I like that a lot because it's it's a romance. Did you forget? I totally forgot it was a romance. <laughs> it's like, oh, it must be sci-fi. <laughs> All right. Now we have sci-fi. Lauren says, Lauren, oh, Lauren says, is it ever too late to regret anything? I oh. think once the ship has sailed on reversing, like it's after you've gotten a tattoo, <laughs> it's a little too Like, yeah, the re it's never too late to feel regret. You're right. It's never too late to feel regret but like there's no function to regret after a certain point certainly after someone sliced into your brain but yeah. yeah all right this next one comes from a YA sci-fi it says I lost my chokehold on aeroline when waves surged across the low ledge and we were swept into the capital O ocean friends why it's not a proper noun yeah. <laughs> like uh Either name the ocean, uh, which I would not encourage you to do because if you are naming a made up ocean, no one cares. Or just don't, like, there's just ocean. I love that we're starting in the action. Yeah. Um, right into, you know, what is clearly a very um, active scene. Yeah, very And you know, adrenaline filled scene. So I love that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the word chokehold makes me wonder whether it is. Um, I'm helping this person or I'm choking this person. That's a great, great uh, question. So, and maybe that, that's meant to be unclear as, as the scene wears on. So I would, I would just be aware of that, that that word makes me wonder which it is. Um, but, but yeah, I love that we're starting in the action here. Yeah. Airline is such a strange word. And I feel like it is the name of a, it doesn't feel like the name name of a person it feels like the name of a thing or like a ship and so I was a little confused by that because it doesn't it doesn't seem like the name of a person I don't know I just found that very strange uh and I agree chokehold is a weird choice here right um who knows but I agree the right place to start for sure which I think is half the battle so good job on that 333, adult general commercial, me and my sewing machine had been securely attached for 10 years. My fortune would be, I think this is a typo. My fortune would be made by her side. This is a comma slice, my friends. A comma slice occurs when we have a comma in place of end punctuation or in place of comma plus conjunction. Uh, which is how we join two independent clauses, uh, you know, into one sentence. So I'm very guilty of, of that well, in my writing. Well, I didn't see any in the finished product of Love Love. So <laughs> good, good, good job to your editor. Good copy um, editing. Yeah. Good. Oh. Uh, yeah. I mean, this is obviously the easiest way to, to fix it, but it's not a great, it's not a great fix. Yeah. I think the first question that came to my mind was if you've already had the sewing machine for 10 years, um, why haven't you already made the fortune? That's a great question. Also, is it supposed to be a pun that they've been securely attached? Because like they're sewn together. Is that, is that supposed to be funny oh. or is it? I can't tell. This is pretty boring for me. Uh, yeah, I don't, 
I don't know what it means to be securely attached to a sewing machine. And I don't know. Yeah, I just don't know. It, I like the way that in some ways the sewing machine is anthropomorphized. It's, it's given a female pronoun, right? I, my fortune would be made by her side. So there's this mm -hmm. sense that there's a really strong connection between this person and their sewing machine. And actually, Rosie says the sewing machine should have a human name. Maybe so. And maybe she does, right? We might even learn that in a later sentence. But yeah. for me, this just doesn't introduce conflicts or meaningful character enough. Like, I know, I think I know more about the sewing machine than the person who uses it at this point. So what if it was flipped and it was my fortune would be made with my sewing machine by my side or something to that effect where we start with the person first? Maybe. Um, and yeah. kind of I think what like, the goal is. More to your point. Um, you know, I had been lugging around the same, you know, I don't know how much sewing machines weigh, but like, let's say, you know, I've been lugging around the same 20 pound singer for the last 10 years waiting to make my fortune or something like that. You know, like, I, I guess give us some conflict or give us some, some notion of what, what, what this is like, what's the takeaway, I guess, is yeah. my question. Um, I just don't think there's enough meat on the bone for me. Yeah. And it's, I think it goes back to the, the comment you made about, you know, asking the right questions and leading you to ask the right questions. We're definitely asking questions with this one. I don't know if they're the questions that the author is intending yeah. for us to ask. And so we want to make sure that we're asking the questions that they want us to be asking. A hundred percent. Yes. Um, so that for me kind of falls flat. Let's see what's next. Oh, another romance. I needed five glasses of Zuz and an entire wheel of brie to nibble on like a rat in the storage closet at the boutique if I was going to survive the rest of the night. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No notes. I, I love everything about it. <laughs> uh, tell us what you like about it. Tell us. Um, well, I love, so yeah, so I love that it has voice and mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's voicey, you get a feel right off the bat in one sentence for, you know, the story is going to be sort of fun and, um, you know, maybe self deprecating a little bit, which I really love. And, you know, the combination of the detail, she's hiding in a storage closet. Why is she in the closet? Right? I mean, I just I think it's so fun. It is fun. I worry a little like it is so self deprecating. I almost worry it's comparing oneself to vermin that gets me here. Uh, <laughs> the rat part I could pop maybe take out yes. yes I don't love like why not just like even yeah and just take that yep I need it and like also five glasses is a bottle so just Uh, or like I, I, uh, yeah, I needed oh, an entire wheel of brie. We need something here to indicate that like the action related to these things. Obviously, she doesn't just need these things in the closet. She needs, um, I am, yeah, there's more to do here, but I just, there's no reason to compare yourself to a rat. Like I just, you want to have both warm feelings between your reader and yourself. Um, I've been called out in the comments for rat phobia and yeah, I'm going to own that. That's fine. Um, <laughs> guilty as charged. Uh, so I, I would keep working this. I think, uh, uh, it feels the original, if we look at it again, um, it feels a little bit Bridget Jones era to me in the sense that it's like every detail, like I'm funny and self-deprecating and pithy. like there's just something a little heavy-handed about it for me you're right I mean there's definitely words that could come out of here like the five yep. glasses versus the bottle right it feels yep. like a small change but once you start taking out those words it feels a lot more crisp and and concise to the so that you don't lose the the joke if you will or the humor yes. or the, the self-deprecation exactly. that's here yep. yeah and, and I see that for sure. I I feel like yes the voice is there and I love the confidence of the humor I wouldn't want to mm -hmm. lose that um, I love the way that we are brought onto the inside of her private moment 
instead of being part of the society that she's trying to escape from, mm -hmm. right? Like, so we're, we're, we're kind of hiding with this person. We're in the closet with her, yeah. Exactly. Okay, um, what are we hiding from? Exactly. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, so I think that, like, fewer words, a little less comparing ourselves to rats, and we will really be in business here. So I think this is in the right direction, but not quite fully baked. Okay. To an adult historical we go. Despite his pa's orders to keep quiet or get rooked, when a chestnut hare hopped across the snow-covered field and into his sight, West squeezed the trigger. Mm. Mm. I like this one. I think it's got, it's got, it's doing a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we know it's adult historical. Mm -hmm. So this is a child of some sort, potentially, um, but old enough to will be holding a gun or a BB gun or whatever it is. Right. So I'm curious about the age of the person who, who is the focus of the sentence. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. Young enough about... to be threatened with a whooping. So right. seems quite young. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely keep reading. Yeah. I, I, uh, I'm also curious about why he was ordered to keep quiet if they are hunting mm. and, you know, they have to be quiet to not scare off game, then squeezing the trigger um, to shoot the hare is the right choice. Yeah. Unless they're waiting for bigger game, right? And so I'm, I'm curious about that. I think this is a nice little line. I it's like not it. not especially a story that I would be compelled to keep reading, like just personally, but it's a well-constructed sentence. This is a really good, solid line. Agreed. Yeah. Good job. Good job, adult. Good job, author 335. Just anonymizing everybody's numbers. Okay. Oh, look, another romance. Kel Surprise. <laughs> I hear footsteps outside the door and wonder if the clandestine occupation of a hotel broom closet is a crime punishable by law. For hiding in a closet again. Yep. A lot of that this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm stuck on clandestine occupation. Mm -hmm. It's because occupation has so many meanings. And we had a line like this a couple, like maybe last week in First Line Frenzy. The word Eve was similarly problematic because Eve can mean the night of or the night before or like the time immediately preceding. And so, yeah, uh, this is supposed to mean occupation as in people are occupying, but it also feels like it could be like the occupation as in the a job like because it also means a job i think it's just confusing um it's also awkward right yeah the i i i tripped tripped on clandestine occupation mm -hmm. but i i think one of the things the other line did really well hide all, the, all the, the other hiding in the closet is there was a level of specificity specificity to it um you know she has the the move and the and the brie and so um this feels a little bit wider mm -hmm. um so maybe we could give another detail or two around either who the person is or what they're hiding from um or and not giving it all away right but just some level some other detail that would kind of hook us in even more well i also feel like if you're hiding in a broom closet in a hotel you better expect to hear footsteps outside the door it's a hotel <laughs> and like i, I just i, I yeah, I don't know. I feel like this is the right moment to start, like this person hiding in the closet. It's just not the right thing to focus on. Like if you if you were really curious if it's a crime punishable, like punishable by law, which again, is an awkward phrase. Um, like, why are you in there? What forced you in there? Or like, yeah. I guess I'm more interested in how this person came to be in the closet than the fact that they're there. Yeah, and maybe that's the additional detail that we're missing is kind of what led them to be in the closet or what they're what they're potentially hiding from. Um, there we go. Confirm. Okay, here we go. I'm going to move on. Sorry, I had to do a little administrative finagling there, but I have done it. Okay. Line 337 from a middle grade thriller suspense. I was so shocked to see this on my list because middle grade does not often bring us to the thriller suspense 
Mm. Well, all right, I guess. Um, at least not what I see in my first time frenzy list. So Beatrix spun the beads on her new necklace, an unwelcome surprise from her mother and Walt, twirling them between her fingers while a murder of crows cawed wildly overhead. It's eerie. It definitely it's very eerie. eerie. Anytime you can incorporate a murder of crows, I feel like we're in for something, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. Just, so you definitely are, you can feel sort of the eerie ambiance of the scene. And I love that if, if um, thriller and suspense for middle grade is not often used, I love the idea of, of more books in a space that isn't necessarily well represented. So that's fantastic too. It is fantastic. Though you have to question why we don't see more of it. And if the answer is because that's, that won't sell or there are no comps sure. for it, you know, I think the author has to question like, I think this is likely more likely a middle grade mystery, um, sure. which we see a ton of middle grade readers. I have a middle grade reader at home. Middle grade loves mystery. Uh, so I suspect that is actually a miscategorization. This is in fact a mystery. Um, I'm very curious. I love this little detail about the necklace. The idea that it's an un it was an unwelcome surprise from her mother and Walt. Uh, and Walt, we're, yeah. by naming Walt, we assume he is, I'm going to, my assumption is that it's the mother's boyfriend. Mm -hmm. Or stepdad. Um, or, yeah, someone who she does not identify or, like, doesn't call by another more maybe loving or familial name. Yeah. Um, but if we take that out, which is always a good practice whenever you use a parenthetical phrase, it's always a good idea to take it out to check your grammar. So Beatrix spun the beads on her new necklace, twirling them between her fingers while a murder of crows clawed wildly over a head. And when we take that, when we take out the parenthetical and just look at that on its own, what I notice is that there is a, a causation issue. We're like, why are we mentioning the murder of crows? It has nothing to do with her twirling these beads on the necklace. And so these things are happening concurrently. Mm -hmm. But in that sense, you are just giving us a fact cake. Beatrix fiddles with her necklace and crows caw overhead. Yeah, that's a good point. So maybe the crows kind of indicate to her that it's a reminder of how unwelcome the necklace is. Well, or these are just two things that are happening. And the author actually hasn't provided us with any, like, anything to go on here right like this this is where the emotion of the sentence lives but you have to see that grammatically that's been relegated by these m dashes to being a non-essential phrase mm. so if the only emotional crux of a sentence is in its least essential part have, have we done our job and i don't think we have because essentially this is a fact cake about wearing a necklace and nature and they're not related at all now, if she hears the hears or sees the crows overhead and grabs at the necklace in some kind of like, if this is a compulsion, if she feels like she has to do something because the crows are bad luck, like that is all very interesting to me. Yeah. But just her kind of being like, well, birds and well, beads, not interesting. So I think this one is, um, again, there's this nice tension here, but the emotional truth of this is is located here and these lines indicate to us that this is the sort of least important part of the sentence so i think this is just maybe needs some tweaking and we should understand how the crows sort of like i i, I agree with you saying a murder of crows is so ominous and so heavy but like why why is that important here um, so I think it could, it's, it's on its way. I definitely trust in this, in this author's ability to put together a nice sentence, yeah. but I don't think that yeah. one's cooked yet. Oh, we've arrived at our last one just in time. Cause then we can talk a little bit about love buzz. So this last one comes from a YA sci-fi dystopian and it reads in an odd stroke of fate, Gaia received the Terra Gen invitation on the same day that her mother was summoned to the plains. She couldn't have known it then but traveling to the surface was the only way she could save her mother. Well, let's just capitalize every noun so that people know it's sci-fi. 
This is a pet peeve of mine. The planes, the surface, the Terrigen. At like, I just, just, I don't know, man. I kind of just like, what if the sentence was just traveling to the surface was the only way she could save her mother? That's a great edit. I love that. And like, There's a lot like, of information before that that we could get in the first couple of paragraphs. Yeah. Like, unless the surface is not the surface of the Earth. Like, unless the surface is a place other than the surface of a planet or the Earth, don't <coughs> capitalize it. Capitalizing everything in sci-fi is, like, one of the most annoying things sci-fi writers do. <laughs> uh, I agree. Traveling to the surface this is the only way she, Gaia could save her mother. Also, naming a character Gaia is a real weird choice. I feel like it fits the sci-fi dystopian space. Yeah, but Gaia is the Earth Mother. Gaia is already oh. like an active deity, like a like a a god force for. Oh, I see. Like Wiccans and other, like I yeah, Gaia is already. She's got her her. She's got a full plate already. I feel like Gaia. So maybe it's intentional, so and there's a you know a connection in some way that we find out later on. So unless it's intentional. I'm sure there is, but for some readers, this is like naming your character Jesus, and I just feel mm -hmm. like it's not going to go over well. Interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know Obviously, about that. there's something, like, earthy happening, right? Like, Terra Gen, the surface, the planes. Like, we know there's an Earth element here. We don't need to be beat over the head with it by naming your main character Gaia. Um, and, like, also reach a little deeper. Like, find other Earth words that are meaningful that aren't sort of also loaded with meaning um, mm -hmm. for your readers already. I'm coming back. Don't be alarmed. So that was the end. That was the end. How'd you feel? You did a great job. Thank you. It's, again, very fun and full circle to be now on this side of things. So I appreciate yeah. you having me. It's better, right? It's better to yeah. be on <laughs> um, What was your favorite? Who gets a copy of Love? Oh, gosh. I was writing down some as we went. Um, even though we made some edits, I really did initially like 334, which was the hiding in the closet with the brie and the vuv, just because yep. I like the look of that. You did respond very positively. I did, but I also yeah. liked the first two a lot as well. What, what did you like? Um, I did like the first one, Drake Bloodworth and his fancy cars. Uh, I did like the second one, but for me, it's DQ'd by the use of the word savages. Like, it's 2023. Come on, we're not doing that anymore. So that's a DQ for me. Um, I loved our edit to the literary one all time. Yes. <laughs> I liked yes. a lot of our edits today. I thought we did a great job. Uh, let me see. I, I like the adult historical, the adult historical one was a great sentence. I just, it just didn't grab my attention. Like it just, but I'm not, I'm very picky about what non, I read a lot of historical romance, but of the historical fiction I read that's non-romance, I'm like extremely picky. And I probably would not be attracted to that novel. Um, so yeah, I would say number one, or the, the Brie, you did really, you, you initially had no notes on that. <laughs> I feel like you have to choose that one. It's your choice. You get to choose. You're the oh, author. I get to choose. All right. Well, then I guess I did actually like 335 as well, which was that historical, I think. Yes, the, that one was very good too. I did like that one a lot as well. But I, I think I'm, I think we'll go with the Brie. I like that. I, I'm biased, obviously, for, to, a, to a good Well, and now book. you know that they're going to love the book. They're like very likely to enjoy your book. <laughs> We send them a free copy. Um, there we go. Me, Good idea. I'm going to I'm gonna go. I'm going to see. I'm going to mark it in my list now so that I don't screw up and forget. Hold on. Um, so you're, so the debut day is, is next Tuesday? Yes. Love Us comes out on Tuesday. So we're a couple days away. Are you, like, what is the anxiety level? It's high. You know, as someone who likes control, you have no control over so many steps of this process, including publication, but it's exciting. You know, it's, it's been years in the making. So it's, you know, it's exciting to finally have it out there and have people be able to read and, you know, find its readership. And that's all you can really ask for when, when putting a book out is that it's going to find the people who connect with it. Okay. However, you have a nice boost because you have a 
some great blurbs on this. Emily Griffin blurbed you, which is amazing. Um, I have, have an, I think this is an art copy. So I have different, like mine looks different on the back than it will look for people who buy the book. But you got some amazing stuff for this. I'm so proud for, for you. Like not Thank you, you. nothing to do with it, but like you did such a good job. Great job. Um, and I've loved, I love the look of all of the marketing. It's just so unique with the colors, like really beautiful. Um, can I read one of my, my favorite lines? Oh, okay. I, sure. I know technically I don't know if this is like, I, if this could have been edited further after I received my copy, but, um, in, so, uh, uh the main character receives, um, a card with quotes from the little prince which is one of my favorite books and has been since i first read it as a kid and so it, this this quote starts with a quote from the little prince which is love does not consist of gazing at each other but in looking outward together in the same direction and then our character comes back in and, and thinks i thought it summed us up perfectly even then but now i wonder if looking out in the same direction for too long made me lose track of who was standing beside me <laughs> Great, um, Serena, the protagonist, meets this uh, meets someone in college uh, and stays with him for a long time. And so, and I'm, that's not a spoiler, I don't think. I'm not giving anything away here. And I just feel like that is such a true thing to feel when you are with someone from your 20s, you know, your, your early 20s, and then like years pass. And like you had all these big dreams and you were looking to the future, but then the future arrives and you're like, Oh, huh. You know? I just, that was an amazing line for me. I loved that. Oh, thank you. And I thought that was really beautiful. Hold on. Oh, Oh, I also don't want to spoil anything for anyone, but I'm just going to go on record as saying the end of part one. Uh, I like the, the, the gasp I got, like, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. It was so unexpected. And I was like, wow, you really, you really took me for a ride there. Uh, so that was a great moment for me too. And then I have another, I marked this whole page because I was too lazy to get up and get a pen. Gosh darn it. Oh, well. So if I'd say, I mark this up a lot, and I really, really loved reading it, and I know everybody else is, too. So uh, people can pre-order. Um, Barnes & Noble is having a huge pre-order sale right now. It yeah, ends on Friday. Yeah, there's, right? there's a huge Barnes & Noble. It's 25% off right now. 25% um, off all pre-orders. Um, so if you yeah. go ahead and pre-order before uh, midnight tomorrow, you they will ship it out to you on, on Tuesday Pepsi. or on on Tuesday, or you can pick it up at your local Barnes & Noble on Tuesday, and you can get 25% off, which is amazing. Um, and yeah, just, oh, do you know, is it the audiobook out the same day? Yes. And yes. I looked up your narrator, but I didn't it's, recognize them. It's Deepest I don't, Samuel. She's amazing. Um, she I have her Deepest Samuel before, and she's very, very good. Yes, she's amazing. Um, it was so surreal to just kind of hear it come to life in a voice other than my own in my head. Um, or Gwyneth Paltrow's on Speechify, because I like to do that as well. But um, yeah, she just, she did a great, great job. She was a, a really great get for this. So mm -hmm. I love that. I loved, I love Serena. She's so, um, she made some unexpected choices that I loved that I was, they were the choices I wanted her to make, but I thought narratively she wouldn't be able to make them. So I thought you also just, from like a sort of editorial standpoint, did a great job of creating a character who was allowed to be really authentic, even within the confines of a three act structure where there are certain expectations that a reader brings to a novel and you manage to satisfy those while giving us a really three dimensional, like funny, smart, complex woman. Um, and I just, I wish you the absolute best of luck with this. I thought it was phenomenal and I can't wait to hear what, are you already at work on the next book? 
I am. I, I handed in um, developmental edits yesterday because I just wanted it off of my plate as quickly as possible. Um, so it's with my editor now. And um, I think we have a March 2024 pub date. So that's exciting. So exciting. Will yeah. You come back and join us on first. I would love to. Before then, but also then. I would uh, love to. And yes. Yeah, this is amazing. I'm super, yes. super stoked for you. Cannot think of someone who has worked harder for it. And I wish you the very best of luck with it. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. Like I said, it's a very full circle moment. So this is a fun one for me. I love that. And see, everybody watching, all you have to do to get on First Line Frenzy is <laughs> um, write a book, find an agent, get a book deal, and bring it all the way to publication. And then you too can join me on First Line Frenzy. <laughs> uh, Neely, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. everybody who tuned in, thank you so much. Don't forget to pre-order. Barnes & Noble has a great sale right now. Uh, and the replay of this will be up on YouTube by the end of the day, so you can just play it again. <laughs> All right, everyone. Bye. Thank you.